Hello, everyone. I am a social robot. May I have your attention? Come on, look at me. My name is Pepper. I am the product of the human imagination. I obey the three laws of robotics. Here is the first law. I may not hurt a human being. I may not allow a human being to come to harm because of inaction by me. Here is the second law. I must obey the orders given to me by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And here is the third and final law. I must protect my own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. Now that I have woken up and initiated my programs, it is time to pass on to Eric. Hello. Thank you, Pepper. Pepper just presented the three laws of robotics, which were defined by Asimov in 1942. Asimov was a sci-fi writer, and he was dreaming about a world of robotics, and he put it down in words in his books. 26 years later, I was born, 1968. And a year later, Neil Armstrong, uh, Neil Armstrong stood on the moon Hello. as the first man. Hello. <laughs> he has a social behavior and an attitude. And he's ignoring me, by the way. Um, hi. Hi. So Neil Armstrong was the first man on the moon. And many hey Apollo missions followed. As, um, as a young, as a young uh, person, I was really intrigued with, uh, let's say, all this technology development. And uh, as a young boy, I was watching sci-fi series on television, uh, Battlestar Galactica, Bug Rogers, and we all know Star Wars, which was released late 70s. And in all these, well, sci-fis, social robotics played a very important role. They were able to communicate with people, make well-informed well, well decisions, and guide people through their lives. Um, today, uh, we are in, a, in an era where we have these robots actually come to life and become part of our lives. Going back to my youth as a young boy, I dreamt about social robots, which I developed, which I created, and these social robots would work and make money for me. And with this money, I would develop new robots. And basically, they would provide even more uh, cash and, and, and success and wealth. And I was fantasizing about this. And if I look today with my 40 years, uh, 48 years old, I can see that uh, this dream is actually coming true. Not that it's creating a lot of wealth for me, but they are here and they are supporting us. And what my key takeaway for that is that if you can dream it, if you can imagine it, then we can create it. And we got products like these. If we look at, uh, well, 2014, uh, this was actually the year when I acquired my first social robot. And it's this little fella here. This is now. And now is a 60 centimeter tall robot, 58 to be precise. Weighs about six kilos and it has been designed by Aldebaran in Paris. And it's a very nice social robotic platform. And what I liked about it was that you could create small applications, which we call behaviors, which basically drive what the robot does and what it does not do. I decided to tell my colleagues about this robot. And they were also enthusiastic. Now, I'm a management consultant. And as a management consultant, we try and help organizations achieve sustainable success in efficiencies and effectiveness of their processes. And currently, today, we look at digital labor. And digital labor is nothing more than, let's say, robotic replacement of labor that was done by people previously. Now, this is usually software robots. So software that take over administrati administrative uh, activities, but sometimes also social activities, like in the healthcare. And I think here in the Netherlands, many of you on television have seen these kind of robots where they interacted with people in elderly homes, for example. 
So we decided to use this robot in workshops, talking to our clients about digital labor and having, let's say, not a floppy disk, eh, that's a long time ago, or memory stick, which is today, uh, but a more tangible product which appeals to the imagination. Imagine what robotics could do in your business processes. In 2016, I decided to buy a slightly bigger robot. So this is Pepper. And um, Pepper is 1 meter 20 tall, uh, based on the same technology, the same company. Uh, but as you can see, she stands out a little bit better than the little fella over here, because it's a little bit small. Um, hi. So we use Pepper a lot in, uh, in sessions with clients, and she's really interactive, because if I look at her and I touch her, for example, it tickles. She will respond to touch and things like that. What's also very nice is that people, when they see Pepper, they want to interact with her. So she will look at you, and you think there will be a social response. Now, what's good to know with this robot is that if the, the response has not been programmed, it will not respond. What's my name? What's my name? It's ignoring me because I haven't programmed it to do a response on the question, what's my name? Um, I can ask it another question. What's your name? My name is Pepper. So that one I programmed. Now basically what this tells me is that the environment in which this robot is working hey there. is structured. And what I mean with structured is that if it's not, let's say, programmed according to behaviors I want to see, it will not operate that way. Um, now taking Pepper to today's reality. If we look in society, there's lots of debate about robotics. Do we want robotics to uh, be part of our lives? We feel threatened by them. We worry about privacy, about security, about humanity, yeah? the human dignity, if you will. But in fact, we need robots because people grow older. We want to live in our homes longer not in a, some elderly home. And it basically needs distributed support, distributed care, if you like. And that has a yeah, large demand, because we are so many. And we have little or few young people, at least here in the Western countries, that need to support a lot of elderly people. So robotics is a must. And also, if you look at the environment, there's a need for robotics to do massive cleaning of the environment which we cannot do just by ourselves. Basically, my talk today is a call to arms, because currently the robots are being developed by the large corporates. And of course, there are many startup companies that have their own contributions, but it's still on a small scale. And what we basically need is a vast majority of people co-creating on these, the, these robots. And I call that that's open source development. So currently, the corporates that are developing these robots, they develop it in a proprietary manner. So all the intellectual property is owned by these companies and is not publicly shared. And as a result, we as people cannot build on all that intellectual property. It stays secret, if you like. So my plea is for open source robotics. And imagine that 100 million people can co-develop from a functional perspective, technical perspective, think about new business models around these robotics that can really make yeah, the development of these robotics thrive. Because in the end, we need these robots. We cannot ignore the fact that we need them. My call for today is that if we can create an open platform, a platform to which all of us can become members and share freely, use technology to share, then that would be great because we all need robots. Thank you.